And I apologize for bringing another sports analogy into a Sunday message, but it was the best one I could come up with. (laughs) Visualize yourself as the first round draft pick and you're on the goal line with a football and you've been told to win your job in the NFL. You've got to take that ball and run it all the way to the other end line and score a goal by yourself. The opponent that you face is not a regular team from the NFL of 11 players. It's 11 players plus the head coach, the offensive coordinator, and the defensive coordinator. And it's not one team, it's all 32 NFL teams together at one time. For the fact checkers in the audience, 14 times 32 is 448. The ratio of 300 men to 135 is 450, but it didn't matter. And here's why it didn't matter. They attacked at night. They couldn't see. And according to plan, neither could the Midians. They didn't know what they were up against. They saw three groups of 100 men with lights in the distance surrounding the valley. And they heard the clamor and the clatter of broken jars. And then they heard the command for God and for Gideon. And what did they do? What do fearful fearful people do when they're desperate? They respond in a way that's uncharacteristic of who they maybe really are. Kind of like the person who's afraid of spiders and sees a spider. That spider doesn't stand a chance, does it? The Midianites turned on one another. And that day, 120,000 Midianites were either killed or left the area at the hand of Gideon and his unlikely army. Um, And only God can be given the credit for something like that. Chapter 20, we learn just at the right time, they blew the trumpet, smashed the jars and held the torches high. My paraphrase, but that's what happened. That's what we know from these verses. But we move on to chapter, uh, to chapter, or chapter eight, excuse me. And we, we learn that shortly after these battles, Gideon, or, uh, yeah, Gideon begins to take things into his own hands. My paraphrase is Gideon begins to do things that are right in his own eyes with self-confidence. Ultimately, he, he decides on a new lifestyle. In verse 21, Gideon killed the remaining kings of the Midianites and he took their prized possessions. He was recognized as the hero that saved the region of Manasseh from the evil marauding Bedouins. So much so that the community, the townspeople came to him and said, Gideon, be our king. And to his credit, at that moment, Gideon said, no, I won't be your king. My sons won't be your king and my grandsons won't be your king for the Lord is your ruler. And then he showed his heart. He said, I will take your gold. That would be akin in today's history of of maybe General Patton saying, we've, we've won the war, give me a raise, give me a bonus, I wanna retire. Gideon collected, I believe it was 1,700 shekels. Again, for you fact checkers, you can do the math, but I believe 1,700 shekels of gold equated through ounces of gold at today's price of gold would be close to a million five. That could have made a pretty handsome retirement for a military leader in those days. I don't know what the equivalent uh, in Gideon's time might be. But a little bit of success and a little bit of money can be a dangerous combination.
In verse 21, we read that Gideon killed the remaining kings of the Midianites and took their possessions. And in 24, we read, after turning down the kingship of Abiezer, he asked for their gold. And in 29 to 31, we read, Gideon returns home. He seeks a life of pleasure. He took many wives. He had 70 sons, one named Abimelech from a prostitute. But he lived a good long life for many more years. What an odd way. What an odd way to end the story of Gideon. But for those of you who read your lesson, we know it didn't end there, did it? Because his legacy in Abimelech was quite colorful. You see, Abimelech, after his father was gone, decides to organize his mother's side of the family and to seek a kingship of that area of the promised land. And he convinces his mother's family to vote him into office. He gets into office and what's he do? He seeks his power and his glory. And he becomes a ruthless ruler. He kills all 70 of his brothers. But one. So that he can have the glory and the power. And ultimately the consequence is his brutal death himself at the hand of a woman and at the hand of one of his own soldiers to save his face, his embarrassment. There's some life lessons that I wanted to bring to you today that I think we all need to think a bit about. There's many places in the Bible in which we are reminded we need to have no fear because God is for us. But yet, how many of us are called to do great things and we find in our heart of hearts that we feel inadequate and we're fearful? Romans 8.31 gives us a bit of guidance. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God proved that to Gideon, didn't he? In Psalms 56, 11, we read, In God I trust and I am not afraid. What can man do to me? We know that when we find ourselves in need of acting courageous amidst fear, we've been given the Holy Spirit for those that have repented and accepted Jesus. And we can call upon the Holy Spirit to help us with the great tasks at hand that we find ourselves called to. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul reminded the church in chapter 3, 13, and as for you brothers and sisters, never tired of doing what is good. Never tired of doing what is good. In Revelation, we read in chapter 2, verse 10, the second half, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faith, faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So about that slippery slope of success, say that three times real fast. <laughs> we have a third life lesson. A couple of verses that I found that start us down that path might be Proverbs chapter 16, verse five. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. You know, God had, had already warned Midian that it was real likely all the Israelites would want to take credit if he had a big set of troops to fight the Midianites and they won. And that's why he required him to bring it down to 300. So they would know if they just thought for a moment that it couldn't have been them 
that defeated the Midianites. And the end result oftentimes of our success is a bit of pride and arrogance. And of course, that's exactly the temptation that Midian, I mean, that Gideon fell into. In Isaiah, as Isaiah chapter two, verse 12, we read the Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted and they will be humbled. How many wildly successful people do we know that take credit for all they've been gifted, that has given them all they've been blessed with? We all know political leaders, we all know athletes, we all know movie stars, all of which have fallen prey to the sin of pride and arrogance. In his uh, series, video series on the book of Judges, the mega pastor J.D. Greer gives us five danger signs of success that I think we can relate to. Think back in your life when you achieve something that you're really proud of and, and justifiably so. Maybe you're proud of the fact that you graduated from college and you're the first in your family to ever do that. I know myself, when I passed the CPA exam, I was pretty proud. Uh, it's not often that you find many new graduates who pass the CPA exam, and I clearly was proud of that. But a little bit of resting on my laurels, a little bit of pride, a little bit of money from a new job, and a little bit of extra time since I wasn't in school was a dangerous, dangerous combination. I bet many of you know what I'm talking about. And I was humbled. J.D. Greer puts it this way, one of the danger signs of success is infrequent prayer. Why is that? Why would he start with that? Well, it's pretty clear to me. When we're enjoying the fruits of our recent accomplishments, what are we thinking about? Are we thinking about God? Let me give you an example that I came up with on my mind. Let's say you've been working for a promotion and you finally achieve it. What is our most common result from that promotion immediately? It's a little bit of celebration, isn't it? You worked hard, you earned it. So what do we do? We take our spouse or we take a friend or a number of friends and we go celebrate. We might have a very expensive meal. We might go out for a night on the town. And as we're celebrating that success, what do we talk about? Well, we might talk about, what can I do with this new money? Uh, we could pay, pay down some debts, I suppose. But more often than not, we start talking about what? How about our vacation? We talk about a trip to Disneyland, right? We talk about the new car that we know we're going to need soon. Everybody's going to need a car sooner or later. Why not now? Or we talk about remodeling the kitchen or something of that sort. That's our human nature. And it's our human nature in America more so than just about any place, I suspect. The second danger of success that J.D. Greer shared with us is the failure to consult others. Most of us in America, we talked about this this morning in our life group. We like our independence. We like our, we like our privacy. We like making our own decisions, don't we? Why do we need anybody else's opinion? My mother once told me when I was suggesting a different path, I don't need you to tell me how to spend my money. She didn't mean it in a mean way. She was sincere. And because she didn't ask for my advice, she deserved, I deserve that. But the Lord tells us through his word that we need to seek divine wisdom through divine counsel. There's no better place than right here with our elders and our pastor, maybe our life group members to help us through life, asking their opinion thinking a little bit about what other things might there be that I might do with my new success than what I thought about last night over dinner. J.D. Greer goes on to say another danger of success is resentment. 
Well, why would that be? Why would resentment be a danger sign? Well, if you don't get enough respect and credit for your achievements, what are you going to do? What is the likely response? Isn't that resentment? Don't you get a little offended when people don't give you the credit you feel like you're work, you, you deserve for the job that you did? And of, four, of course, the fourth one here is one we can all relate to. How many of us know successful people that flaunt their successes through their wealth, through their materialistic excess? We see it a lot. Doesn't matter what successful purpose, person we're talking about. Lastly, he talks a little bit about the constant worry about your reputation. Now, that's an odd sign of danger of success. But think about it. Sometimes we achieve a certain success and we create more and more expectations from others. Well, if he did that, let's see if he can do this. If he, did it, if he defeated that military, let's see if he can defeat the other military. If he won the playoffs, let's see if he can win the Super Bowl. And suddenly you find yourself defending your past and your reputation, right? It's a common aspect of success. I call it the slippery slope of success because we've all been there and we all have known that. And so we've given five ideas that can help us uh, prepare ourselves and defend ourselves from that. But I asked myself as I prepared this lesson, what, what could or should Gideon have done with that success that he was given? One of the first things that came to my mind is he could learn to love the Lord with all his heart, soul, and mind and love his neighbor as himself as we were commanded by Jesus. He chose not to do that. He chose to go home, to live a life of pleasure, serving him and his own needs. What would it have been like if he had continued the relationship that he learned about in that wine press when he was thrashing wheat. He might have repented of his sins and rebuilt his relationship with the Lord. That's certainly something he could have done like King David. We know something about King David. King David was after the Lord's heart, but he was a mere man with real weaknesses. Yet he was a leader and he repented of his sins. He was forgiven. He went on to ask forgiveness for those that he had abandoned. What would Gideon's legacy be like if he had gone to those 70 sons? Maybe even the family of Abimelech's mother, his concubine wife, and ask for their forgiveness. Gideon could have glorified God with his time, his talent, and his treasure. And he could have done so generously because he built an ephod out of gold that become the weakness of his town and turned into idol worship within one generation. He could have influenced that if he chose, but he chose not to. He chose instead to serve himself with his newfound glory from his newfound success. Lastly, but not least, Gideon could have ministered to his family, all of them, both sides. How might his legacy have changed if Gideon had taken the time to share his weaknesses, his temptations and what he had failed in? I submit it'd be much different men were called upon to be leaders, spiritual leaders of our family. What if Gideon had taken the time to be that spiritual leader? In the book of Jeremiah chapter nine, verses 23 and 24, we read, 
Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 11, we read, the rich are wise in their own eyes. One who is poor and discerning sees how deluded they are. We probably all know that. But in our next success, how easy will it be for us to forget that? We worship a wonderful Lord who promises amazing things. In his word, he's given us many examples where he's delivered on those promises. If you think you won't have an opportunity for similar success and similar temptation, I think you're wrong. I think you need to prepare yourself and reflect. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, we read, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive graves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. On your next success, reflect on who the Lord is and what great gifts he's given you to achieve whatever it may be you achieved. Maybe it was the new job you always wanted Maybe it was the sale of a business that you worked your whole life to grow and to increase its value, to create your own wealth. Reflect on why it is that maybe he gave you that opportunity and ask yourself, how is it you can avoid that little bit of Gideon that exists inside of all of us and serve your Lord better? As we wrap up, we call the uh, praise team to the the stage. I, I wanted to finish by just asking these few interesting questions that I don't have answers for. Maybe you do. We all know wildly successful people. They may be movie stars or athletes. They may be elected officials. They may be corporate executives, industry magnates. I shared this morning in our life group that I was fortunate enough to go to the Kennedy Space Center. The Kennedy Space Center is an amazing museum of history on space exploration in America. People my age can relate directly to what that was like in the media of the late 60s and early 70s and on. But what's interesting today at the Space Center in Florida is you can actually see the launch pads of Cape Canaveral, except today they're privately funded. These are highly successful people that we know. Elon Musk and his SpaceX launch site is visible. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, and um, what's it called? Blue Origin, I believe, is visible from the Kennedy Space Center. Wildly successful people doing big, big things. But here's the question. Where do these people go to church? Who ministers to these people? In fact, it caused me to ask a, a question that We have an answer for. 
in our midst today, do we have any wildly successful people like that in our congregation? If you scan the directory, you'll probably say, not that, not that successful. But we do have some successful people here, big achievers. And here's the question. How are we ministering to them? In fact, I had to ask myself, are we afraid of successful people? Is it our habit to envy what they've achieved? Because I know we're all called to minister to all of God's children. He loved us all. He gave us his son for all of us. And we all fall short of the glory of the Lord, each and every one of us. So take those questions with you. If you find answers that you can share with me, please do. But remember that slippery slope of success and the legacy that you'd really like to leave from your successes as well.